You are unique, one of a kind, made of the eternal intelligence which gives you claim upon eternal life. At times like that, just look up and leave. It's up to us to go down the road that leads us back home. It's up to us to see we already are what we want to be. Don't give in to what others say. President Kimball was such a wonderful man. He's the first prophet that I have memory of, and I remember how reverent our home got when it was his turn to speak in conference. Isn't that a great message from him? You are indeed unique, one of a kind. I bear witness of that. It's a beautiful day here at Worth of Souls podcast. I'm Brent. I'm Andrea. Welcome back. Welcome to Thought Habit number eight. I have no power over what others think, feel, and do. If you have made it to this lesson, you are obviously committed to a level of learning that has the heavens rejoicing. We're clapping for you, (laughs) making it this far. (laughs) We we just want you to know that that we're so excited for the learning that's going on. And we hope that you remember that the point of all this is to become one with Jesus Christ. We never, ever want you to feel overwhelmed by trying to, you know, quote, keep up with all of the thought habits, because that is not the focus of what we are here for. I know when I was first introduced to all of this material, Personally, I just dove in and I listened over and over and over again. Sometimes I would focus on one thought habit at a time, but more than anything, I just felt like I needed to learn by osmosis, by listening again and again and again, and that really worked for me. But I've also talked with others who just take one thought habit at a time very slowly and methodically, and then they move to another one and then another one. And that works really well for them. So however is best for you to learn, whatever that looks like for you, the whole point is whether or not we are feeling the spirit every day and how he directs us to use our energy and which thought habit we personally need to work on right now. Always, please, always seek Heavenly Father's help to know what is best for you in your spiritual growth. We get to progress with the Spirit's counsel and the Spirit's direction first and foremost. That's exactly (laughs) right. Always focus on what the Spirit is telling you to do. That'll be your greatest guide. The last time we talked, we were discussing what true freedom is and that the Lord has told us that the power is in us. And that I am the one who has the power over what I think, feel, and do. That we are not victims to anything or anyone. The world would have us think differently. So many voices right now try to convince us that we are not agents unto ourselves. That we are not responsible for what we are creating in our lives. As an antidote to this, we talked about getting the beam out of our own eye first. When we complain, we know that we are the ones that have the problem. And when we reset our expectations, it can be a huge way to set ourselves up for victory when those daily enticements come our way. How did you do between last lesson and this one, resetting your expectations? We'd love to hear about the experiences that you had on our Facebook and Instagram, any light bulb moments that might have come along. Yeah, when I first learned the concept of really completely rethinking all of my expectations, the light bulbs that went off for me they were huge. Well, they were constant, and especially for me with, with parenting. Yeah. You know, resetting those expectations with, with parenting was such a huge, uh, huge light bulb moment for me. Today is really a companion lesson to the last one that I have no power over what others think, feel, and do. In honest reality, we wish we could have taught these lessons together because of how closely related they are, but we couldn't because that obviously would have been just way too long. (laughs) Nobody would have listened to it. Way too long. (laughs) As a temple president over my own temple, we talked about this. I am accountable for what I think, feel, and do within my temple. I am not accountable for what others think, feel, and do within their temples. This includes my spouse, my children, 
my parents, my boss, my coworkers, members of my ward, my neighbors, friends, or any other person in our life. Now, I do have stewardship assignments that include all of these people. There is a huge difference between feeling accountable for someone else's life and their choices and carrying out a stewardship assignment for someone else in my life. Only you and the Lord know what your motivations are when it comes to the other people in your life. And so often, we have people who try to get us to take responsibility over what happens in their temples. Here are some just quick real-life examples, like my mother that's unhappy in assisted living because she feels like I, quote, never visit. She feels like everyone has forgotten her. My friend that is unhappy with me because I haven't paid back money that I borrowed on time. My spouse is upset because I won't participate in their hobby and I don't like it like they do. Or my child's teacher is unhappy with my child's behavior and tries to get me to own his feelings about it. Or my daughter is unhappy because she's having issues with her friends and she wants me to solve it. In, there's tons of situations like this that come up in our lives. And in these situations, I am being expected to solve an issue for someone else and how they are feeling. We all have times when this happens and when someone blames us or tries to get us to take responsibility for what is happening within their temples or they complain to us about someone else in their life that's causing them misery or they we find out they're complaining to other people about us, you know, all of those round and round circles that we go in inside of our humanity reactions. When someone is in my life is disowning, like we talked about last time, I have an opportunity to counsel myself correctly. The truth is, is that I can't take ownership over what is happening in someone else's temple. Now, we know this is easier said than done most of the time. (laughs) All of the time. (laughs) All of the time. (laughs) Especially because there are some people in our lives that can weave webs of emotional manipulation, sometimes in very crafty, subtle ways. But here's the good news. There are steps that we can take in order to avoid taking ownership over someone else's problem. We want to go over those with you. First, I have got to counsel myself with the truth. And it includes the truths about myself and how I contributed to the situation. Also, the truth is that I don't have power over anyone else's emotions that they are creating in their temples. I will never be their solution. Their only solution can be found with their Lord and their Savior, Jesus Christ. The second step is to recognize that the other person also made choices to contribute to the problem, tell ourselves the truth about that, and they're trying to avoid facing the pain of being responsible for their own choices. And then the third step is to see their blame for truly what it is that they are disowning and that their blame are stories that they're telling themselves about the situation and about me. And then the fourth step is to recognize that I do have a stewardship responsibility in each of these situations. And stewardship does not mean ownership over their thoughts and their feelings. Okay, so let's look at these steps in a real life application. Something that happened to someone very close to me. So I was asked to head up the organization of our award Christmas party a number of years ago, and it didn't go well. I really enjoy putting events together. In fact, Andrea and I really thrive on it. We love it. So it was an easy yes for me to be in charge of the party. I'll admit that with Andrea and me as a team, we usually don't need much help with an event this small. So I went into it not planning on delegating much, if anything at all. As the week of the party approached, when I usually would start pulling everything together with Andrea, she got called out of town last minute with a family emergency. Then the next day, I got extremely sick. So sick, I could not get out of bed. When I did get out of bed, it was to rush to the bathroom, and my head was pounding. I could hardly think, let alone try to put together a party. 
So I made a very hard decision, and I called my bishop to tell him that I could not do the party. He asked me what I what I had ready for it, and I sheepishly had to tell him that I didn't have anything, quote, ready at all, that everything was either in my head or in my garage. I, I could so easily see the mistakes, and it was eating me up, and, and that I had let everyone down. I suggested to him that he change the date of the party so that I could have time to get better and still be in charge of it rather than drop it in someone else's lap at the last minute. But he didn't want to go that route. Um, and so with a lot of guilt broiling inside of me, I hung up and settled in to, to make myself well. I heard from some friends in the ward that called to check up on me that uh, the bishop and the Relief Society president were scrambling to put the party together and they weren't being too shy about bad-mouthing me to, to some of the other, other ward members for dropping the ball. Bishop said you didn't delegate anything. Is that true? One of my friends uh, asked me, and, and sheepishly I had to face my many mistakes again and, and admit that I, I hadn't. I texted the bishop and let him know the things that I had in my garage that I was planning on using and let him know that he was welcome to come by and get them. And I also let him know the ideas I had about food, neither of which he chose to utilize. Andrea also heard from a few sisters in the ward that some negative things were said about our family from the Relief Society president as well. And it really did hurt to hear those things. I felt horrible. I went into the should feelings, like just feeling all those, oh, I should have done this. I could have done that. And I condemned myself for not delegating. I put myself down for thinking that I could take it all on by myself. I... I worried and stressed that that they would never forgive me and never ask me to do anything again in the future. The party did come together with many, many ward members stepping up at the last minute to fix my mistakes, but I was left with a lot of darkness feelings, both because of my own self-condemnation, but especially because I was really worried about what my friends in the ward thought about me now. The next time I made it to church, I made sure to pull the bishop aside and tell him how sorry I was and that I had heard that the party had come off nicely. He didn't offer any forgiveness, just reiterated that a lot of wonderful ward members really helped to to make it work. It was really hard for me in the coming weeks to make eye contact with bishop or Relief Society president, and I was carrying around a lot of guilt for what had happened, but also a lot of hurt feelings about the bad mouthing that they had done. Needless to say, I, I wasn't practicing the steps that Andrea just talked about. I was absolutely owning the feelings of those other people and letting them keep me in darkness. Eventually, those relationships were repaired and all was forgiven, but I could have gone through that experience in a better way. So let's look at that experience through the steps that we just talked about and see how differently it could have gone. First, when I realized the mistakes that I, that I had made, I could start by telling myself the truth, that I had not delegated anything, and I truly had set myself up for failure because life always happens. I could also tell myself the truth that I couldn't control the emergency that happened in Andrea's family or my getting sick. That is a truth. It was also true that I had made a promise that I did not keep, and the bishop and the Relief Society president got stuck with the cleanup. That is also a truth. Another truth is that I am not in charge of either of their feelings or if they choose to badmouth me behind my back. The second thing I could have realized in this situation is that the Bishop and Relief Society president also made decisions. I recommended they change the date, but they chose not to. I offered a few things that I had prepared, but they rejected them. Their choices added to the stress, and I couldn't take ownership over those choices. The third thing I could realize is that they were both trying to get me to take responsibility for the stress that they felt. I can't do that. I am not responsible for the feelings they generate about me or how long they choose to hold on to them. And finally, I could have realized that I have a stewardship responsibility over my relationships with the Bishop and Relief Society president. So I can turn to the Lord and ask him what he wants me to do to begin repairing those things. I could write both of them an email, letting them know how sorry I was and what I had learned about delegation as a result of my mistakes. 
What I can't do is take ownership over them accepting that apology or not. That is up to them and really a true consequence of my actions. Yeah, that was a very interesting situation. And both of us learned quite a lot going through that. I mean, and no matter what life happens, we all make mistakes. Um, I think about how Brent could have utilized the steps to not take ownership over people's feelings. And it really honestly could have helped repair the situation a lot quicker and faster and helped him get out of darkness faster and get back into a spiritual focus. And honestly, I use these steps to avoid ownership over other people's problems a lot. (laughs) I write in my journal when issues come up with the people in my life. They've actually been incredibly helpful for me when things have come up between me and Brent in our relationship, when really tough things have happened that we've had to figure out. And when we've followed these steps, it's been amazingly therapeutic. We'll write them down and talk to each other about what it is that we processed. I actually also really like to write things like this out on a whiteboard that I have in my bedroom. I like to see it in front of me. It's her processing whiteboard. Sometimes <laughs> sometimes it's her scheduling whiteboard, but sometimes it's her processing whiteboard. It's true. I have to throw it up and get it out of my body so that the emotions don't settle. <laughs> and I remember a time when a conflict came up between me and Brent several years ago, and I wrote on my whiteboard constantly for days it felt like I wrote down the truth about his part in the problem. I wrote the truth about my part in the problem. I wrote down how he was trying to get me to own things that were not mine. And I admitted to myself, told the truth to myself where I was being a victim in our relationship and where I was trying to make him responsible for my feelings. And I wrote down my stewardship assignments within how to keep working on our marriage. It was so therapeutic. I highly recommend using these steps within your own personal self-counseling sessions, especially in your interpersonal uh, relationships. The Lord will help us find emotional solutions when we are spiritually focused. And when we're wallowing around in what Brent was describing with the Christmas party, spiritual focus doesn't happen. All adversities and enticements that are happening to ourselves and to those other people, they are for their spiritual growth as well as our own. All right. So with this in mind, let's look back at those few examples that we gave and and look at them a little bit more in depth. With my mom that is in assisted living, it expands the problem when I try to own her feelings. That will never work. I do did not need to accept responsibility for when she uses disowning statements like, oh, if somebody would just visit me, I wouldn't be so miserable. The reality is that her happiness is up to her, and it wouldn't matter if I spent 24 hours a day there. What I can do is follow the inspiration about that stewardship assignment of when I need to visit my mom. I also get to recognize that visiting might not change what she is choosing to put inside of her temple that's making her angry. I am not her solution. Christ is. These adversities are for her spiritual growth. And with my friend that is upset because I owe him money, it expands the problem when I condemn myself for being late paying him back. Just like with my mom, me paying him back might not change him being angry with me. He is the only one that can control that. What I can do is follow the inspiration that I get about my financial stewardships and pay my friend back just as soon as I can, then ask for forgiveness for being late. I can't control what he is running through his mind and heart about me. This is part of the consequences I get to go through for being late paying back the money. And this situation can be used for my spiritual growth as well as his, if he so chooses. Yeah, exactly. And what about the example with the daughter? I've got to recognize that she and her friends don't have the full capacity to love yet. And it expands the problem when I think that my daughter's self-worth will increase if she doesn't have issues with friends. She could have all the friends in the world, but that won't make her happy. Jesus is the only solution for my daughter's self-esteem. When she runs truth through her mind and heart about herself, she will find joy in who she is It doesn't matter what her friends do or say. 
My stewardship assignment will lead me to help my daughter understand how she can spiritually focus because this situation is for her spiritual growth. Elder Uchtdorf, I love Uchtdorf, in his talk of regrets and resolutions, said really well how we are not in charge of anyone else's happiness. He said it this way. So often we get caught up in the illusion that there is something just beyond our reach that would bring us happiness, a better family situation, a better financial situation, or the end of a challenging trial. The older we get, the more we look back and realize that external circumstances don't really matter or determine our happiness. We determine our happiness. You and I are ultimately in charge of our happiness. Brothers and sisters, no matter our circumstances, no matter our challenges or trials, there is something in each day to embrace and cherish. There is something in each day that can bring gratitude and joy if only we will see and appreciate it. Let us resolve to be happy regardless of our circumstances. You are the only one who could recognize when you are giving your power away to the emotions of other people and when others are trying to get you to make them happy. You can never make anyone happy. It's just not your job. You can follow a stewardship assignment for the people in your life, but their happiness is between them and the Lord. The best way to serve Heavenly Father is by finding out how He wants me to handle the situations with His children around me. I can be an instrument in the Lord's hands to find out where He wants me to be a comfort, to be a support, to be a light, but I am not their solution. The Lord is. Their source of inner peace must come from Heavenly Father and our Savior. And it's really good for me to realize also that someone else's pain and suffering can be for their good if it draws them closer to their Heavenly Father and their Savior. All right. So with that segue, let's go into the big subject that's full of lots of triggers. Yes. Specifically about this with not being in charge of other people's temples. Parenting. (laughs) The big daddy subject. In parenting, there is a big difference between carrying out our stewardship and taking responsibility for what my children think, feel, and do. We are not responsible for what they choose to do inside of their temples. We do have some stewardship responsibilities that the scriptures tell us are under our influence. Let's look at a few of those. In DNC 68, it tells us that we have a stewardship assignment to teach our children correct principles. And then in DNC 93, it tells us that we have a stewardship assignment to raise our children in light and truth. Also in DNC 121, it tells us that we have a stewardship assignment to influence our children in righteousness. We do this by kindness, gentleness, meekness, and love unfeigned. And we are given permission to reprove betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost and show them after an increase of love. And we can only reprove when we're in a spiritual focus. Exactly. Yeah. It can never happen through lecturing and rejecting the child. That's exactly right. And that, unfortunately, is the direction that most of us as parents go is – we talk down to them and, and they feel the rejection feelings from us as their parent. And right. that's not what the scripture is talking it's an about. Easy, when, when natural reproof, man reaction right? that we get to work on. Another really important scripture to look at is in 2 Nephi that, that tells us when, when we're taking stewardship responsibility over our children, we need to talk of Christ, rejoice in Christ, preach of Christ, prophesy of Christ, so that our children may know where they can look for a remission of their sins. Jesus is always the way. That's right. Exactly. That actually reminds me of something that happened in our lives a few years ago that I want to tell you about. There was a particular day that I was getting really discouraged with parenting, particularly homeschooling. I've mentioned before that we homeschool. And I had just recently spoken with several parents who had homeschooled and raised their kids in the gospel. And then... As their kids moved out of their house, they watched as one by one their children left and they fell away from their testimonies. 
After all of these conversations, I slunk big time into a negative headspace of, you know, what am I doing all this hard work for if they're just going to fall away anyway? Yeah, the rug was really pulled out from under her for a few days. It was tough. It was. It really was. It was a very temporal headspace that I was in. And I had to get to the point where I, I, I could tell myself the truth that I had assumed that when I started homeschooling, I had told myself subconsciously that it would be a, quote, fail safe in order to save my kids. And after these conversations with these families, that false assumption, it just crumbled underneath me. And we all do false assumptions about things. So I invite you to take a moment to think about something like that in your life, what it might look like. So anyway, after this, the spirit directed me to call one of my friends. Her name is Amy. She has older kids than I do, and she has a level of wisdom that the spirit knew could really help me inside of this. She listened to me process and talk about this, and and then she just paused, and she told me something that I will never forget. She said this, you know, Andrea, the family proclamation never says to raise righteous children. It only says to raise our children in righteousness. And there is a huge difference between those two. After I got off the phone with her, I went to the proclamation and I read it again. President Hinckley, if you'll remember, he first read the the family proclamation in the women's session of conference. The section that my friend was talking about says this. Parents have a sacred duty to rear their children in love and righteousness, to provide for their physical and spiritual needs, to teach them to love and serve one another, to observe the commandments of God, and to be law-abiding citizens wherever they live. When I reread this again with these new eyes, it, it was like a lift. I felt like this burden was taken off of my shoulders. And it lifted me from the responsibility I felt like that I had to somehow control what my children would turn out like. And I was able to ask myself questions, truthful questions of, am I rearing them in love? Yes. Am I rearing them in righteousness? Yes. Am I doing my best teaching them to love and serve and keep the commandments? And the answer to that is yes. And After letting that sink in, I just went to the Lord and I told him, Father, I will keep doing whatever it is that you are asking me to do with my family because I I want to know that I can stand before you and say with a full purpose of heart that I did what you asked me to do. And then I just want to give the outcome of my children back to you. And I gave him back that outcome. I'm sure I will have to keep doing this over and over and over again, but it was very powerful for me. So what if we're not perfect parents? What if one of our children has fallen away from the church? Or what if one falls or many fall away from the church in the future? Let's look at some not so perfect parents from the scriptures. From the scriptures. That's right. What about, the scriptures. Le- what about Lehi and Sariah? They were amazing people, and they had two sons that led nations away. And maybe it's great for you to look at Lehi and Sarai because you have a Laman and Lemuel in your house that are just causing so much turmoil and need a ton of your support. What about Elma the Elder? He prayed for his son for an exceptionally long time to come back to the faith. The scriptures obviously never tell us how long it took, whether it was six months or five years or ten years. We don't know. But we do know that while he was praying for him to come back, his son was leading people away from the church, not just himself. How stalwart must Alma and his wife have been to stay on their knees? How calloused have their knees must have been? Their knees had calluses on them, I think, because it would not surprise me if they had prayed for a really long time. For years and years and years. Yeah. And what what about Adam and Eve? I mean, they had one of their sons commit murder. I, I, that hasn't happened at our house. Yeah. I hope Against it, I a hope sibling. It, I hope it hasn't <laughs> happened to your house either. But they didn't have the junior high and high school program or the gang program to mess their kids up. They had the hunting and the fishing. And they still had one of their sons fall 
to the adversary. What about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the patriarchs of the Old Testament? If you read their stories, <laughs> oh my word, they, they have <laughs> they crazy, crazy soap opera style things yeah. going on in their families. <laughs> and we could give example after example in the scriptures of, of how these parents, these righteous parents – raise children that use their power of their agency to not follow the path of righteousness that they were taught. Well, and even I think about our perfect parents. Our heavenly parents lost a third part of their children. And it's not because they didn't do come follow me every week and that they didn't do family home evening. Like they they were perfect parents up there. And they were in an atmosphere that wasn't the telestial realm. It was the perfect realm there. And they still lost a third part of their their children. As a mom, I think about my mother in heaven in this and the heartache that she has gone through because of losing a third of her children. It just, it makes me so emotional even to think about that, especially because she never gets them back. Oh, man, she understands. If there's anybody who understands, Heavenly Mother understands. We are not accountable for what our children choose to do with their power of agency. And when we were putting together this lesson, the spirit woke me up one day. It was like one of those, bing, you have to get a hold of your friend Carolyn and have her share her feelings and experiences because people need to hear it. So I did. I got a hold of her. She and her husband raised their five children in the gospel, doing what they thought was right for their family and teaching them correct principles. And one by one, all of her children, except for one, has left the church. They all left with varying degrees of decisions within their marriages and lifestyles. She shared this with me, quote, There are so many times when I feel like I messed up on my art project that the Lord gave me. He gifted me these children and this family, and I feel like somehow I messed this up. I look back and I do a lot of should have thoughts, and I wonder things like, would they be different if I would have done X, Y, and Z? Or would they have turned out different with a different family or a different mother? I've churned so many thoughts of self-condemnation and doubt and frustration about what else I could have done that might have made a difference for them. There are so many times over the last 20 years of my children being inactive that I have met the Lord on the bathroom floor, just crying and feeling the immense pain and sorrow that comes from your children leaving the church. I go through phases of grief even still after the, all of these years. Sometimes I can't go on Instagram and see pictures of mothers posting about their kids getting married in the temple. It's hard for me to see family pictures of extended families that look like their family are all in the church. I'm not embarrassed by any of my kids, but I don't want them to be judged by other people because I don't have the picture-perfect family. I know through the years— I'm very aware of all the people who have wondered, wow, what did they do wrong to have so many of their kids leave the church? I'm not naive to the judgments that people throw around in our church culture. And there are voices in my head that can go into deep, negative self-condemnation about myself and what we did wrong. I know that is where Satan wants to push me. He wants me in that darkness and wallowing in my grief. He pushes me into the pit of despair. I used to be in that pit constantly when my children first left, but the atonement of Jesus Christ has lifted me so much, lifted my grief and my pain as I have turned to him through all of this. I know that the Lord just trusted me with these specific souls. Getting to the point of giving this to the Savior does not mean that I have overcome all of my struggles, but it does mean that I know He is the one that lifts my pain. When the grief surfaces again, I meet Him again on the bathroom floor and give Him more of what I am feeling. He is the one that gets me through. Close quote. I love so much how she has learned to rely on her Savior. And as a parent, I have learned so much from her example. 
she did share a few more things that I also want to include. Quote, even after going through different trials with my children, the Lord has taught me some amazing things. He has changed me. Every part of me is different. He has taught me to love as he loves. He has taught me about the power of keeping my covenants. I know one of the biggest blessings that has come from my husband and I keeping our covenants is that we have wonderful relationships with each one of our children. They know we love them and accept them unconditionally. They talk to me about anything and everything, and they are not bitter against the church. Quite the opposite. They are grateful for the way that we raised them and helped them to be the people they are today. That is a beautiful blessing that we have received from keeping our covenants with the Lord. She finished her thoughts to me in this way. Quote, the scripture story that gives me the most comfort as a mother of inactive children is the story about Aminadab in Helaman chapter 5. He was a dissenter from the church that was living among the Lamanites. When the prison walls fell and Nephi and Lehi walked out, Aminadab turned and saw them. He was the witness that saw how Nephi and Lehi were turning to the heavens and talking with angels. Aminadab was the witness that got everyone around to turn back and look to see what was happening. And then everyone around asked him what was going on. And Aminadab, who was the dissenter, was able to witness to what was happening around them. When I read this story, it gives me great hope because it testifies to me that my kids still have the light of the gospel inside of them and that if something like that happened around them, I believe that they could recognize it for what it was just like Aminadab recognized it. Even though I have felt like I messed up my art project. The teacher of the class is the Lord. And when I get to show my project, my teacher is going to love me no matter what the art project looks like on the outside, whether it's a masterpiece or totally screwed up. These were Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother's children long before I got a turn with them. And I have peace knowing that I am doing my best. I am always asking for their advice, how to love my kids, and I always ask for miracles. I think that is what we are here to learn on earth. We are here to learn how to bring our best light out and how to bring the best light out in others. And when it gets rocky and windy and hard, you just keep hanging on. Peace comes from the trust I have in my heavenly parents and in my Savior, Jesus Christ. Close quote. Oh, I love Carolyn so much, and I love how real she is, and she can speak and relate to those of you who might be feeling and experiencing exactly what she's gone through with children outside of the gospel. And more than anything, as we talk about these thought habits of Jesus Christ, we hope and we pray that you can find your Savior in all of your journeys, whatever your particular life's package looks like, to find your Savior there with you on your bathroom floor. I am also really grateful to Carolyn for sharing that witness with us. Such a beautiful story. Elder Packer has given an amazing talk about the struggles of parenting in the latter days. He said this. It is a great challenge to raise a family in the darkening mists of our moral environment. We emphasize that the greatest work you will do within the walls of your own home and that no other success can compensate for failure in the home. The measure of our success, however, as parents will not rest solely on how our children turn out. That judgment would be just only if we could raise our families in a perfectly moral environment, and that now is not possible. It is not uncommon for responsible parents to lose one of their children for a time to influences over which they have no control. They agonize over rebellious sons and daughters. They're puzzled over why they are so helpless when they've tried so hard to do what they should do. It is my conviction that those wicked influences one day will be overruled. The prophet Joseph Smith taught and he never taught a more comforting doctrine, that the eternal sealing of faithful parents and the divine promises made to them for valiant service in the cause of truth would save not only themselves, but likewise their posterity. Though some of the sheep may wander, the eye of the shepherd is upon them, and sooner or later 
The tentacles of divine providence will be reaching out after them and drawing them back to the fold. Either in this life or the life to come, they will return. They will have to pay their debt to justice. They will suffer for their sins and may tread a thorny path. But if it leads them at last, like the penitent prodigal, to a loving and forgiving father's heart and home, the painful experience will not have been in vain. Pray for your careless and disobedient children. Hold on to them with your faith. Hope on, trust on, till you see the salvation of God. Please, please hold on to your covenants. Your covenants have power, so much power. Because your children struggle, it does not mean that you need ever let go of that iron rod. Never step off that covenant path. Elder Bednar reemphasized holding on to our covenants as parents in an Enzyme article that he wrote. He said this, Parents who honor temple covenants are in a position to exert great spiritual influence over time on their children. Faithful members of the church can find comfort in knowing that they can lay claim to the promises of divine guidance and power through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and the privileges of the priesthood in their efforts to help family members receive the blessings of salvation and exaltation. The tentacles of divine providence may be considered a type of spiritual power, a heavenly pull or tug that entices a wandering child to return to the fold eventually. Such an influence cannot override the moral agency of a child, but nonetheless can invite and beckon. Ultimately, a child must exercise his or her moral agency and respond in faith, repent with full purpose of heart, and act in accordance with the teachings of Christ. Close quote. What this is telling me is to not underestimate the power of our covenants as parents. When we have taught our children enlightened truth, then we give our children to God and wait to see the salvation of the Lord in their lives. Take a deep breath. That was the heavy parenting discussion. <laughs> it's time now to switch and go to a little bit lighter parenting discussion. We want to talk about parenting programs is what we like to call them. And this discussion is specifically for parents who still have children in your home, younger children and teenagers. But even for those of you with grandchildren or aunts and uncles out there, it's still very, very good information. We give our freedom away by trying to get our children to solve our problems for us so that we can look or feel better as parents. For example, doing chores doing scripture study, having family prayer, doing come follow me, making the bed, eating healthy food, drink that dang green shake. <laughs> Stop leaving your clothes on the bathroom floor. <laughs> Keeping your children from fighting, getting to church on time. All of these activities, they're, they're what we like to call parent programs, and they're all good. They're part of our stewardship assignments in raising our kids. But we want to specifically talk about our motive for doing these activities. We've got to ask ourselves some specific questions. What are we doing these parent programs for? Are we doing them so we can feel like we're doing our duty as a parent? If so, temporal focus. Temporal focus. <laughs> do we do them to check them off our list? Temporal, temporal focus. focus. Um, what about doing any of these? Are they more important than the relationship of the child? Temporal and focus. Temporal focus. <laughs> exactly. Are we using these parent programs for our spiritual growth? Or are we only using them to teach my children responsibility? Doing my job. Temporal focus. <laughs> That's right. If we're doing these parent programs with the false expectations that your children are going to perform perfectly all the time, always obey, never give pushback, never have a bad day, then we will get hooked every time. Our, Karen, our, our kids always perform perfectly every day. <laughs> Don't yours? <laughs> when my kids listen to this, I want you to know you have been my best spiritual growth tool in my life. And I love you for it. I really, truly, truly do love you for it. And logically, I mean, as parents, we know that saying that our kids, you know, if we think that our kids won't do perfectly all the time, but we've got to admit to ourselves that when we get hooked by their 
performance, basically, it's because we have false expectations and they're rooted in these illogical thoughts of perfection. Now, only you can answer these questions for yourself about you and your family. And you've got to be honest with yourself about what your main outcome that you want is from these parent programs. And really, what we want our main motive to be is to carry out a stewardship assignment to glorify God and to build a better relationship with our child. And maybe maybe you are having a hard time determining what your motive really is. And guess what? You can actually find out your main subconscious motive for any parent program when the activity is not done by the child. Like when you want your kids to go do their chores after dinner and they don't do it, that is going to show you really quick the emotions that you have from their rejection. It'll show you your main motive for what you're wanting from them in order to complete that parent program. So let's go into a really quick application story with this. Uh, When I obviously mentioned that we're homeschoolers, and when we first started homeschooling, I had this idealistic picture in my mind of what it would look like. And I think a lot of people out there who see homeschooling families have this same (laughs) idealistic idea. (laughs) Uh, I promise. I was met with very sore disappointment. After a few months of homeschooling, I was a nagging, frazzled fool of a mother. (laughs) I was like, what? I had to step back and evaluate my motives for why I started doing this in the first place. And I remember the day that I was honest with myself. We talked about this in the beginning with the steps that you have to take in order to stop owning other people's stuff. And I had to admit to myself that I started homeschooling Because I had this idea in my mind that it would guarantee wonderful, obedient, never to fall away, astray children. And obviously, that's a very false expectation. My desired outcome was control over how I wanted my children to turn out. And it was my main motive was not to build better relationships with my kids or to glorify God, per se. And in that answer of when I was honest... And I had to, I needed to change my motives and change my desired outcome in order to build better relationships with my kids and to be able to stand before the Lord and tell him that I did what I was inspired to do, no matter what my children decided to do with it. Now, you want to set up the conditions so that you as the parent and the child both can win even if the activity is not completed. And as part of evaluating and trying to set up a win-win situation for, for our family, I studied a lot of things out. I prayed and I fasted, and I received the revelation to set up a token system. Now, the token system that we set up, it was simply that for every activity they fulfilled, chores, school assignments, brushing teeth, making beds, that they would receive tokens. And at the end of each day, they could exchange those tokens for playing some video games for a little bit, watching a favorite show for 30 minutes, playing with their friends. I had a family store they could buy something from, um, or they could save up their tokens for a bigger date night with mom and dad. I mean, anybody who's a parent has participated in these types of programs that you set up for your kids. And it was a system that allowed them to be responsible for everything they did. Now, here was the clincher. When we put together the token system, I had to rework my motive. And we set up some understandings, and they were private understandings between me and Brent. We did not tell our kids these. (laughs) My first understanding was that this was a parent program. My children would be happy to just stay in their pajamas all day and watch TV. With the understanding that this was something I wanted that I was able to separate myself from their choices and that I am not in charge of what they decided to do with this token system. So the second understanding that we entered this into this with is that putting this system into place was number one, to build better relationships with my kids, whether they did it or not, and to glorify God 
by te- by being spiritually focused through it. And if I carry this out with those motives, then my relationships with my kids, they're, they're going to be a lot more fun. As their parent, my third understanding is that I had to get right in my mind at the beginning of the day that when they decided not to fulfill their part, that I set my ex- expectations correctly, that they probably wouldn't, that I would not get hooked. And if they decided to stay in their pajamas and not get anything done, it was on their shoulders. It wasn't on mine. And that I could carry out my stewardships as a mom from a place of love and not force. So we began the system with the expectation that nobody would participate. We didn't tell them that. (laughs) Um, But it it was really great, actually. And when I readjusted my expectations that... It would take effort on my part to stay spiritually centered because my children would not keep a good attitude through the program in the long run. And I also knew that my children were going to do their job of being an enticement for me perfectly. They give me a lot of enticements and I get to use them for my spiritual growth. They're doing their job exactly the way Heavenly Father set them up to do it. And I get to become closer to my Heavenly Father and the Savior and I get to build relationships with them at the same time. So when we started the system, the first day, of course, was amazing because it was new and, you know, it always the exciting thing. It was easy. But then the next day and the next day and the next day is when the enticement showed up. My daughter was the first one who decided not to do her stuff. I saw it. I noticed it. But I didn't say anything to her. I left it alone. And when it was time for screens, for any kind of fun screens... Um, which she could use her tokens for by completing her stuff for the day. She was upset because she didn't have any tokens. She wasn't able to participate. And because I had set my expectations correctly, I held space for her, for her emotions. I hugged her. I loved her. I didn't get hooked by the consequences that she gave herself. And when she complained about how unfair it was, it, it didn't trigger me into lecturing her. I had removed the beam from my eye and wasn't wrapped up in my old expectations anymore. And then when my other kids followed through with their assignments in order to earn their fun things, I was able to focus on those children who did their assignments. And this is a really important rule to emphasize what you want duplicated. I feel like that's a huge key with parenting. Emphasize what you want duplicated. And... This stewardship assignment, it was for my spiritual growth and to keep building a relationship with my kids. And this continued with my daughter for a couple of days. And then after several times, you know, she woke up one day and she got her stuff done all before 10 o'clock in the morning. It was a miracle. And then the other kids, they eventually pushed back at it at some point and they learned the same lessons. And Eventually, they got to the point where they could see that I was I had let go of my old habits and behaviors. And I can testify of the truthfulness of all of these things, of the principles of not controlling what my children do in their temples because of of the rewards that it gives. You know, we can't give our kids their performance, the power to determine our value as parents, because that's a temporal focus. The more that we let go and build relationships instead of trying to control actions and emotions, the more we are parenting like our heavenly parents do. And and maybe you're sitting there thinking, oh, that would never work with my family. But that's okay. Part of the point is that this was a revelation for our family, and you are going to receive revelation that's different because it's your family and that's your stewardship. And you've reset your parenting program motivations to be building those relationships with your kids and glorifying the Lord. Through that revelation, it's going to help those relationships grow immensely. A couple more examples from some families that we've talked to over the years. There was a family that really wanted to build some different habits with the cleanliness of their home. They had they had nine kids. So the parents decided to start with just one thing, making the beds every morning, something simple. They talked to the kids about the goal on Sunday night and started it Monday morning. Now, the parents knew to set their expectations that no beds would be made on Monday morning. Of course, they didn't tell their kids this 
It was just the expectation they set inside themselves. And that this whole exercise was to build better relationships with their kids. The first morning after the kids went to the school, mom went and looked at the bedrooms and found that three of the beds had been made out of the nine. Because she had set her expectations correctly, she was ecstatic. If she had expected that all nine beds would be made, she would have been horribly disappointed because she would have been hooked and focused on everybody that didn't follow through. But she was excited for the kids that had actually followed through because she had set her expectations properly. When the kids got home from school, she had three plates of cookies ready for those that had made their beds. And she loved it. The next morning, there were a few more beds made. Some of her kids never got convinced of the program. But that wasn't the point. The point was she was using this as an opportunity to build relationships with the kids that did follow through with it. And she was doing it to help her spiritually focused. After, after making the beds, the family made other goals within those parent programs, little at a time, and it helped their family enormously. And she could tell you that she is way more spiritually focused because of what she's actually having to do with these goals and how much fun she's having, even if her kids are not all the way emotionally bought into all of these parent programs. Yeah, exactly. There was another family who was having some issues with teenagers who were fighting. And the mom was trying to own what was happening between them. You know, mom and dad would get home from work at night and kids would get home. And she just was beside herself because after a long day at work, it was exhausting. And she was getting emotionally wrapped up in their fighting and all the things that happened. So she decided that she was the one with the problem because she was always complaining about how much her kids were fighting. So she got the beam out of her own eye first and then went to the spiritual dimension about how to build better relationships with her teenagers. And she got the revelation that whenever they started to fight at night when everybody got home, that she would get her phone out and she would use the stopwatch to time how long they fought for. And then when they finished... She would write down the time on the fridge and she started rating the fights, which one were the best and which lasted the longest. She didn't say anything to her kids. She just started doing this. <laughs> and she started naming the fights, like giving them titles. <laughs> her kids, after a couple of days, noticed what she was doing <laughs> and why. And they actually started realizing like they would start to fight and they would stop themselves <laughs> because they would realize that their mom was like, you know, having fun with this, timing it, writing it down. <laughs> and but she was ecstatic when they realized and she they stopped fighting themselves like it worked. It was a miracle that happened for her. She didn't even need to say anything to them. She just started having fun with the fighting and building relationships and glorifying God and being spiritually focused instead of getting hooked by it. Now, you can follow the same outline for whatever issue is happening in your home with your own parenting programs. If you notice that you are complaining and getting hooked by something your kids are not following through with on your parenting programs, the first thing you have to do is get the beam out of your own eye. Then the second is determine and be honest with yourself about what the desired outcome really is. When you focus on the temporal activity over and above the relationship with your child, then you are rejecting that child to try and teach them responsibility. But if you are building relationships while you are using these parent programs for spiritual growth, then the Lord will start to give you revelation about how to solve the issues in your home. And you can then create these win-win situations that we're talking about. Obviously, making beds, doing chores are smaller parenting programs. But what about those big issues like teenage children coming home really late or inappropriate cell phone usage or decisions that can lead to way more severe consequences in their lives? All of these things are still designed for your spiritual growth. When your teenage child doesn't come home on time and you can't get a hold of them, what are you running through your mind yeah. and heart? What are you putting there? <laughs> You are using your mind, most likely, if you're like us, to do a worry, to, to scare yourself to death. 
You are seeing pictures of them getting into car accidents, doing drugs with someone, messing up morally, and all the different worry images that come into your mind when we work ourselves up like that. And by the time your child does come through the door, what emotional state are you in? You're scared. You're upset. You're mad. You're hurt. Frustrated. Frustrated. Yeah. Then you see them and you want them to take responsibility for everything that is going on inside of your temple. That leads to you statements like, where were you? You made me so scared. What? We didn't know what happened to you. How could you be so inconsiderate? How could you do this to us? I can't believe you would scare us like that. And we can all just picture the relationship issues that are going to be created from these reactions. Anytime you use you statements, then you are disowning and it's full of rejection. You can actually use I statements in this exact same situation to take ownership over those feelings that you created. When your teenager comes in, you can say, I made myself so upset when I didn't know where you were. I allowed myself to think of all the ways that you could get hurt and I made myself scared. I can't believe I freaked myself out so much. Own up to those feelings that you are creating inside your temple and watch the difference that it makes in that conversation with your child. Can you be spiritually focused during the time that your child is gone and you don't know where they are? Yes. Well, and if you can use the power of your mind to worry and to picture horrible things, then you can also use the power of your mind to picture beautiful things. <laughs> That's exactly right. And, and to do faith. <laughs> Absolutely. And there, there are so many parents that have communicated to us over the years the results that they have had building those relationships with their teenage children and how phenomenal it's been for them. While the kid is gone, you can wash the dishes for Heavenly Father. You can listen to spiritual music. You can read your scriptures. You can visualize angels protecting your child wherever they are and bringing them home safe. You can choose to do whatever you have to to remain spiritually focused, just like Nephi on the ship. Don't do devastating thoughts and worries. Then when your child walks in the door, you hug them, you love them, you tell them how grateful you are that they made it home safe and how happy you are. Emotional miracles are going to happen in your relationship with your teenager when this happens. No, we know this because of all of the people that we have talked to about these emotional miracles that have taken place when they have chosen to spiritually focus during these moments and times. Well, it just shocks their kids yeah. because their kids are expecting the, the blow up yeah. from mom or dad. How dare you do this to me? But they are met with this love instead of the lecture. And the parents, because they stayed spiritually focused, are able to build those relationships and miracles really do occur. Personal revelation is going to come. Have faith in that. Understand that you are not in charge of what others think, feel, and do. You are not in charge of what they are choosing to do inside of their temple. Okay, to recap, you are the temple president over your temple, not your spouse, your kids, your coworker, anybody else in your life, nobody else. In this temporal world, there will always be people who want you to take ownership over their problems. Don't rob them of those chances to grow spiritually. And remember that Heavenly Father doesn't expect us to save our kids. He doesn't expect us to be perfect parents. He expects us to raise our children in righteousness and seek personal revelation with your own parent programs so that you can create win-wins with your family and do your best and then let the Lord have the rest. Jesus Christ is the one who saves. He is the only one who saves. We want to invite you to plant the seed. The seed is, I am not in charge of what others feel, think, and do. I give their choices to the Lord. So first, awaken and arouse your faculties to see the way Christ sees. Of course, there's lots of scriptures and conference talks in order to help with your personal study about this. The thought habit of not being in charge of other people's temple takes a lot of spiritual maturity, and it's full of lots of dynamics. Sometimes it's with little things like making the bed. Sometimes it's with ward families like the Christmas party. And sometimes it's with really big, heavy feelings like children leaving the church. Whatever your particular circumstance is, 
the Spirit will help you with giving the people in your life to God. Because we only have one Savior, and it is not you, and it, it and it's not me. He is the only one that is the solution for every single person on this planet. The second step in Alma's process of change is to exercise that particle of faith to think as Christ thinks. It's really powerful to outline and write down the steps to avoiding ownership over others' problems. Let the Spirit help you identify where you have been doing this in your regular life, where maybe other people have been trying to get you to take ownership over their problems. Then go through writing it out, like in that Christmas party story that we shared. Use the exercises to help you whatever it might, whatever it might be that's happening in those relationships right now. And we have included some ideas of prayer phrases in the sample prayer that we provided on our website as well. Third is a desire to believe and let this desire work in you to feel as Christ feels. Pray for a confirmation from the Spirit of what your stewardship assignments are for the people in your life. And then look for the revelations that are going to come once you have removed the beam from your own eye. Determine those desired outcomes. And then use the eye of faith to see the fruits of this principle. And the eye of faith, it it is those muscles like we talked about with the teenagers to use your mind to do a spiritual focus when you're having problems instead of doing a worry. And there's there's also a guided meditation to help with this visualization as well. Fourth is to give place for a portion of my word and do all of these things because of the love that you have for your Savior. When the love you have for Christ is your motive for getting the beam out of your own eye first and go through the steps of keeping your agency, you are going to stay spiritually focused and discover that the power of your agency is a joyous experience instead of sometimes doing that overwhelm that we so often do. Search, ponder, and pray over these next few days because you love him. And don't cast out by your unbelief, these truths. Don't do an overwhelm by trying to change too many behaviors all at once. Let the Spirit guide you and focus on progress, not perfection. The Spirit will tell you which one of these things to work on first. These past two lessons have been really exciting paradigms for spiritual growth and being willing to see the power of agency with what we talked about last time and this time it, it takes a lot of spiritual maturity and refinement. We testify that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer for us to enjoy the day. Every time it is the answer. And please remember until we talk again that the worth of your soul is great in the sight of God. The Worth of Souls podcast is not an official publication of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you have any questions about the doctrines discussed here, please visit the church's official website for clarification.